Hey guys, I thought I'd spend a few minutes to answer some questions and respond to some comments. I was going to do a video, or the second video on improvising, but haha, -ha, I burned the crap out of my hand and I can't play piano. So Q&A it is. So first up, the Circle of Fifth video has gotten pretty popular and there's been some misconceptions kind of floating around. Um, here's one comment. If I had to stop and draw a circle every time I needed to work out interval relationships, I'd never get anywhere. Now, this is a little bit like if you were talking to a second grader and you said, why are you learning multiplication tables? You should just learn how to you know, multiply single digit numbers. What a waste of time. That is literally what they're learning with the multiplication tables. I mean, if you ask little Timmy what three times seven is, He's not going to stop and draw out a 9x9 nine nine matrix and then find 3 times 7. He's just going to tell you. If you ask me what a fifth above G is, I'm going to say D. I don't need to draw a circle to figure it out, I just know it. If you ask me about F, I'll say C, A flat, E flat, E flat, B flat, you know, B, F sharp, whatever. You know, the circle of fifths is just a way of visualizing and expressing this, you know, fifths relationship between notes. You know, some people mentioned that, you know, they find it easier to visualize a guitar or, a, you know, the piano keys or their saxophone or whatever. Um, however you want to get at that relationship, you know, whatever works for you is great. Um, but remember, the, the eventual goal is to just internalize these fifth relationships. And, you know, if, if someone says C, you know, G is like, it's like my brain has connected those two neurons. They don't need to visualize anything. In fact, Eventually, you shouldn't be visualizing anything. You should just know it immediately. Now, like many things in music, you know, there's lots of different, you know, ways to look at the circle of fists and ways to use it. And, you know, there are times when you probably would want an actual drawn-out circle of fists to look at. You know, say you're writing a song, you know, it might not be obvious to you off the top of your head that the key of A and the key of E flat are, you know, distant keys that don't have very many notes in common, whereas, you know, the circle of fifths makes that really obvious. And that's also not something you would get, you know, thinking about a guitar, at least not, not in any obvious way. And so the circle of fifths is a very elegant way of expressing that. But if you're just trying to recall that fifth relationship, which you need all the time when you're thinking about chords and scales and anything, um, you're just trying to internalize it and the circle of fifths is just a way of getting there. Okay, next question from 3 Poll. He says, Hey Michael, I was wondering if you ever thought of actually making videos to teach how to play the piano, you know, as opposed to what I normally do, which is, you know, theory videos. Um, yes, I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, it keeps me up at night. I would love to do that. In fact, that's one of the main reasons why I started the Patreon campaign is to try to, you know, raise some funds so I can cut back on my, you know, day job and spend more time doing stuff like that. So I've been thinking about that. I've been planning that. I've got lots of ideas, but I, I do still have one big hang up. And that is this. If you go to Google and you type in how to play piano, you will get I think I did it recently, it's like 150 million results. I mean, there is a ton of stuff out there on how to play piano. And I don't just wanna, you know, make a series and then just kind of throw that on the pile, you know, along with everything else. I want to offer something different. I wanna offer something new. Um, so I guess that's a question to you. You know, I'm, I'm sure lots of you guys have, you know, tried to learn to play from YouTube and articles or websites or whatever. What would you like to see? What kind of things have you seen that frustrated you? What kind of things have you seen that you thought were really good? I mean, anything you can give me to help me, you know, figure out how to do something that's unique and not just another one of the tons of tutorials already out there. I mean, anything you can give me would be great. And I, and I am in the planning stage. So any feedback I get now, you know, could have a big effect over the next few months. So anything you can give me, please do. Okay, so third question from Marcus. I've always thought of modes in terms of having the same set of notes and using different ones as the root, like C major and A minor, since in the guitar world, that's mainly how they're explained. Um, and here's a similar one from The Visionary. 
Uh, I am finding extreme differences in the way people are explaining modes. In many other tutorials, they explain it as playing the same scale starting on a different note. Now, I did a video explaining why, um, you know, C major and A minor are different, where, you know, if you take the same group of notes and you, you know, use a different one as a root note, how that changes the way that whole group behaves. But I don't think that's really what's being asked here. You know, the question is, I think, you know, how should you think about this? You know, if you're learning about D mixolydian, for example, should you just think of that as G major with D as a root note? I mean, it, it feels like a very easy way to think about something like D mixolydian. And that's not really how I explained it or the way I've talked about it. Now, I've, I've taught this both ways. I've actually taught for a while. And there's a reason why I no longer you know, try to teach that way. You know, I found that just taking the, the C and A example, if you think of A minor as C major with A as a root note, then you wind up forever stuck with this sort of translation step, you know, when you're trying to think about A. You know, when you think, or when you hear, you know, the chord C, you kind of have to think about that in C and then figure out how that relates to A instead of just realizing that that's your three chord, you know, and you're thinking about A directly. It's kind of like when you're learning a foreign language, you know, if you're learning to speak, say, Spanish, you can't think of everything in English and then translate it to Spanish and then speak Spanish. You know, you're going to forever be doing that and your Spanish is going to be not very fluent. You know, you have to learn to think in Spanish and speak in Spanish. So that's why I've explained modes as... You know, for example, when you're thinking about a G Lydian, try to think of a, a major scale with a raised fourth. You know, that's, you're not really having to translate much. It's very easy to, you know, visualize that difference. Whereas if you're having to think of G Lydian as a D major kind of rearranged somehow, you're really never able to relate to G Lydian the same way you're able to relate to G major. And you never really get comfortable you know, playing and, and doing things in those modes like you should. Now, if you're just trying to figure things out, if you're thinking, okay, what's in an E Phrygian mode? And you think, okay, well, in C major, I have, you know, all these chords. It's okay to figure it out that way, but just know that that's not how you want to wind up thinking. You want to be thinking directly in a mode or directly in a minor key, not having to translate between the two. Okay, so one more quick one. Um, Aaron asked, wouldn't 6-8 just simplify down to 3-4? Now, I did a whole series on time signatures and rhythm, but this is a point that a lot of people get stuck on, so I'll try to give a couple little thoughts here. Um, when it comes to time signatures, time signatures tell you two things. One thing that they tell you is how big a measure should be, you know, how many notes should fill up that measure. So, so three, four tells you that you know, a measure would contain three quarter notes or some equivalent. It could be a half note and a quarter note, whatever. Four, four means that you know, there's four quarter notes in a measure. 12, eight means there's 12 eighth notes in a measure. Six, eight means there's six eighth notes in a measure. Now, in that sense, three, four and six, eight are telling you the same thing. You know, six eighth notes is equivalent to three quarter notes. But time signatures also tell you something else. They tell you what the beat structure is going to be inside one of these measures. They tell you how many of those notes fit inside a beat. Now in three four, you know, three four tells you that a quarter note is a beat. So there'll be one, two, three, you know, three beats inside that measure. Six eight tells you that there are going to be two beats inside the measure, the first beat gets three of those eighth notes and the second beat gets the other three of those eighth notes. Um, and that's not something that's obvious from looking at the time signature. You know, six, eight doesn't really give you any hint that there's going to be two beats inside there. And I explain why that is the case and why there's not, there really just isn't a simpler way to write it. But you, that's just something you have to learn about time signatures and you have to get familiar with the different ones to know what the beat structure is supposed to be. So to answer the question, three, four, and six, eight are different. Even though note-wise they look equivalent, six, eight is telling you there are two beats in that measure and each one gets you know three eighth notes. 
Whereas three, four is telling you that there are three beats in that measure and you know, each one is a quarter note. And, and when you play something in those two different time signatures, it's going to sound completely different. You know, you're going to accent certain notes you know, in one versus accenting them completely differently in another. So thanks for the question, guys. Um, a lot of people have been putting some really great stuff in the comments, like explaining different things that I'm not able to cover in a video or giving different perspectives or whatever. Please keep doing that, it's awesome. I'm so proud of the discussions and comments that happen on my channel. Um, as you guys are just really fantastic. So keep doing that um, and leave me more questions for next time. And next week, hopefully this is better and I'll, I'll be doing a video or another video on improv. So thanks again, see you then.